in the scriptures to the gospel of John chapter 20. Now this is the week following Resurrection Sunday, the greatest, most victorious, most miraculous, most anointed time in our history when Jesus Christ arose from the dead. He is not in the tomb. He is alive. Hallelujah. And he is on the throne today. And I've titled the message, Stay Amazed. Stay Amazed. In John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the Sabbaths, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, they actually went into the upper room to hide. Jesus came and he stood in the midst and he said to them, peace to you. Isn't that interesting that the first words that the Lord spoke after his glorious resurrection were peace? Does anybody need peace this morning? How many know the Prince of Peace arose from the grave to bring you and I peace? Verse 20. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. But Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And other disciples therefore said to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless... I shall see the print of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And then after eight days, the disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and the doors being shut he stood in the midst of them and he said it again. Come on, say it with me. Peace, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and behold my hands. Reach your hands here and thrust it into my side. I love this phrase. Listen to this. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Isn't that good? I think that's a great word to all of us. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Am I talking to any believing believers in the house this morning? And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, even though the disciples were with the Lord for three and a half years, Jesus told them what was coming. He told them what to expect. He was preparing them through his teachings for his suffering, his eventual crucifixion, his death and burial. But then he told them, but on the third day, I will rise again. Yet, they had a major emotional letdown. 
Ed Cole always used to teach the two greatest times when the enemy will try to attack you is right before a great victory or right after one. Because so often, that is a natural time that people just let down. The disciples did it. Go to John 21 with me. We, sh we covered this on Tuesday night at the Bible study. But John 21.1 says, After these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. And Simon Peter says to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you also. And they went out. They entered into a boat immediately. And that night they caught nothing. And you know what I say? Good. Because they were returning back to their old ways. They were going back to the very thing that the Lord called them out of. When the Lord appeared to Peter and to the disciples, he said, leave your nets and leave your boats and come and I will make you fishers of men. But Peter chose to return. And isn't it interesting that Peter had influence on the other disciples because they chose to join him and do the same. Now, we all in life face challenges, struggles, obstacles, and battles. But my first point is this, number one, you and I have to avoid emotional letdowns. Now, we all have emotions, but how many know those emotions can't have us? You and I have got to feed our spirit man so that our spirit man is stronger than our flesh and than our emotions so that we do not live our lives on an emotional roller coaster. There's a lot of opportunities in life to let down, to become disappointed and to become discouraged. But you and I need to choose to stay amazed. Stay amazed. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't get your eyes on other people. They'll disappoint you. Don't get your eyes on yourself. Don't get your eyes on your circumstances because what you see is temporary. But thank God what you don't see, that is what's lasting and eternal. Go to Proverbs chapter 4 with me. Proverbs 4 and verse 20. My son and my daughter, listen to my words. Bow down your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all your flesh. And then verse 23, I love this verse. 
guard your heart. Somebody say, guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows all the issues of life. Put away from you a wicked mouth, and devious lips put far from you. I like this, verse 25. Let your eyes look right on, straight ahead. No turning back. And let your eyelids look straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right hand or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. How I many you know we need to look right on? We all need someone in our life that loves us enough that when we begin to become discouraged, when we begin to pull back, when we begin to give in to negative emotions, they will love us enough to tell us the truth and kick us in the pants. Come on. We all need to be accountable to somebody. We all need an Aaron or a her in our life that will hold up our hands when we grow tired and weary. When we look around, when we compare ourselves to others, we can easily become distracted. We have emotions, but we've got to learn to keep them in check. I love what Paul prayed in Ephesians 3. He said that we would be strengthened with all might in our inner man. In our inner man. We need strengthened so that our emotions do not control us, but that we take charge of our emotions. Amen? Go with me to John 20, verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Thomas said, unless I see the print of the nails in his hands, put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, Jesus was not there when Thomas said that. But eight days later, the Lord shows up and listen to what the Lord says in verse 27. He says to Thomas, reach your finger here and behold my hands. Reach your hand here and thrust it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. The thing I love about the Lord, and my second point is this, he will meet you where you are. Jesus wasn't the one who called Thomas doubting Thomas. I mean, oh, we're the ones that call him that. Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said what he did. But how many of you know he knew what was in his heart? How many know Jesus knows what's in our heart? He knows where you are and he will meet you there at that level. I love the Lord's words to Thomas. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. How many know life is made up of choices? Sometimes we have a choice. 
We could either choose to believe or we could choose to give in to unbelief. We could choose to trust or we could choose to doubt. We could choose to hold our peace or we could choose to get angry and upset. When you and I sense those negative emotions of doubt and unbelief, we've got to address them. We got to deal with them. We got to shatter that stronghold and pull them down and get the doubt out. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 25, I love this story. It's the story of the woman that had the issue of blood. The Bible says she battled that for 12 years. She suffered many things. She visited many physicians. She spent all of her money, but she was none better, but rather she grew worse. And then it says in verse 27, and having heard about Jesus, she came into the press behind him and she touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch only the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And knowing instantly within himself that virtue had gone out of him, Jesus turns around and says to his disciples, who touched me? They said, Lord, there's a lot of people touching me. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. Somebody put a demand on me and drew virtue out of me. Somebody needs to put a demand on the Lord and draw from him whatever you need today. Come on. Now, the interesting thing is, it wasn't the Lord that said, if you touch the hem of my garment, I'll be healed. It was the woman that said, if only I may touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And what happened? The Lord met her at her level of faith. The centurion in the Bible comes to the Lord and says, Lord, my servant is homesick. You don't have to go. Just speak the word only. And I know my servant will be healed. And you know what Jesus did? He spoke the word and his servant was healed. The Lord meets us where we are. The Lord meets us at our level of faith. After the resurrection, Jesus didn't say to Peter, Peter, why did you deny me three times? He didn't say that. But here's what he did say. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? He said it three times. Peter got frustrated. He said, come on, Lord, you know I love you. But why was the Lord doing that? Because he knew Peter had denied him three times and he was speaking to that hurt in Peter's past to get it healed so that he would not turn around and return to his old ways. The Lord will meet us where we are. When Judas came into the garden of Gethsemane to betray the Lord, the Roman soldier said, well, how are we going to know which one he is? It's dark there. 
And Judas said, it will be the one I kiss. So he walks up to Jesus and he kisses the Lord. And what does Jesus say? Friend. Friend. He didn't say betrayer. He said friend. How many believe Judas got the message though? See, Jesus has a way of convicting without condemning. Jesus has a way of convicting without bringing condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Even though Peter was not with the other 11 when the Lord first appeared, some historians say the reason he wasn't there is because he was so discouraged and so disillusioned that he didn't even want to go on and hang with the disciples anymore. But when he shows up eight days later and the Lord appears to him, the Lord didn't say, oh, doubting Thomas. He didn't put that label on him. He met him right where he was. Isn't that wonderful about the Lord? Thank God he meets us right where we are. Thank God he meets us right where we are. Let's go back to John 20 again. Verse 27. Then the Lord says to Thomas, so reach your finger and behold my hands. Reach your hand here and thrust it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas had an encounter with Christ. He had an awakening moment. And my third point is this, and I believe it's one we can all relate to. There is life after letdown. I said there's life after letdown. It's one thing to get down. It's another thing to stay down. Come on. Even though Thomas had the infamous label of being known as, quote, doubting Thomas, he was able to shake it off, to break that label off. And when he had that awakening moment with the Lord, when he said, my Lord and my God, he was able to put those doubts behind him and go on and do great things for Christ. Mistakes, distractions, wrong decisions can get us down, even take us in a wrong direction. But I'm here to tell you when we get down, we can't stay down. Champions always find a way to get back up again. Now, I want you to listen to this because I hope this will encourage you today. Thomas, 
And I hope you never call him Doubting Thomas again. But the reason I used him as an example today is because I think we could all relate to him at times when we give in to negative emotions. We give in to self-pity. We withdraw and I isolate ourselves. We pull back. Thomas went on to preach the gospel in ancient Babylon near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. He ministered extensively throughout current day Iraq before traveling to Persia, which is current day Iran. And he continued to win many disciples to the Christian faith. Then he sailed to Malabar on the west coast of India in 52 AD. He preached throughout India. He established churches. He won many, you know, India has a caste system. He won many high Brahmins to the saving knowledge of Christ as well as many others. And when the Portuguese landed in India in the early 1600s, they found a group of Christians there from the Mar Toma Church, which was established through Thomas's preaching Listen to this, a millennium and a half ago, you talk about fruit that remains. Finally, Thomas travels to the east coast of India where he preached relentlessly until his death in 72 AD. Tradition tells us he was martyred for his faith by being thrown into a pit and pierced through with a spear. He who had so fervently proclaimed his unbelief went on to carry the Christian message of love and forgiveness to the ends of the earth and became known as the apostle to India. Now that, my friends, is life after letdown. That is what you and I need to express and demonstrate when the enemy does his best to trip us up, to get us discouraged, to get us down, and to bombard us with negative emotions. Don't stay down. Ask the Lord for the grace to pick yourself up by your Holy Ghost bootstraps. Come on. And continue to go forward in God, believing there is life after letdown. Let's all stand up together.